folks, you probably saw it on our social channels already. The watch party date has officially been set for February 22nd when Vancouver takes on Seattle. Jeff's going to be in Seattle for that game. So unfortunately, no rink wide from Greta. But tickets are on sale now for just 10 bucks with proceeds going to support Canuck Place Children's Hospice. Your ticket gets you access to the best watch party in the city, Greta's game day food and drink specials, an exclusive swag bag, and a chance to win some sweet prizes with the Canuck Place Children's Hospice raffle. Get your tickets at nationgear.ca before they sell out. We're all going to be there. Harm and I are going to be there. Grady will be there. It's going to be a good, good time. Uh, we'll be hosting it. And hey, I've, I've thrown out the invite. I know people are asking. I've thrown out the invite to Mr. Chris Faber. I know people are wondering. I've thrown out the invite. He knows he's welcome. He's got to buy a ticket though. No free, uh, no free entry for him. Um, oh, yeah. stop come, it. Are you serious? <laughs> oh yeah, dude, hundred percent. I'm making him pay for a ticket. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, probably not. Um, but yeah, check us out. Uh, check us out at Greta on February 22nd. Come watch a game with us, folks. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, let's get to, uh, Jeff Patterson here. Jeff, we made you wait. Are you sad that you can't come to the watch party? Yeah, well, like, two weeks ago, you were like, hey, we're going to have a watch party. And we want you there. And then you're like, now we need you out of the country and like <laughs> not even in the neighborhood. So uh, I haven't had a chance to get down to Climate Pledge. Uh, you know, when I traveled, I saw most of the buildings. There's a couple of new ones, the Mullet and uh, the Islanders new building. Seattle have not been down there yet. And so uh, looking forward to seeing the game there. And uh, look, I'm excited. I heard harm off the top and quads. I'm sure you feel the same way. Like, this is go time. Like, this is 33 games. There are going to be so many good matchups, big games, big tests for the Vancouver Canucks, starting right out of the gate against the Carolina team that is actually better than the Canucks since Christmas. And look at the Canucks. Like, they never lose. And Carolina actually has more points since Christmas than the Vancouver Canucks. And they've got top five special teams. So as much as the Canucks power play looked great heading into the break, you know, can it pick up with the Lewis Lindholm? Uh, what's that going to look like? The integration there. And the penalty kill for the Carolina Hurricanes is one of the best in the National Hockey League. So, uh, look, Carolina's a four-line team. They play hard and structured uh, under Rod Brindamore. This will be a great test for Carolina, but it'll be a great test for the Vancouver Canucks. So it's not the featured matchup on the scoreboard tonight because Vegas and Edmonton are doing their thing. But this is a pretty good one. And uh, what a way to come out of the gate here. Eight of ten on the road for the Vancouver Canucks. And so really curious to see where they are at the end of this 10-game stretch and can they continue to roll the way they have through most of the season. Jeff, they were, Carolina that is, are on a three-game win streak. But is this, Can you say they're still a red-hot team? They're 7-2-1 in their last 10. Can you still say they're red-hot if they've been off for two weeks? Or, you know, January <laughs> well, 27th hey, was the last We'll find out. Quite I, I mean, they don't have Sveshnikov in their lineup. And the Canucks are getting Peter Ketch Kochikov uh, in goal, who <laughs> has been out since January 11th, hasn't faced NHL shooters. So I'd like to see the Canucks try to pepper him early and test him and see where his game is. Um, they saw Antti Ranta here in Vancouver in that game back uh, in early December. And that was sort of the kind of game I think that we expected. It was, you had to be patient on both sides. Uh, ultimately, it was a 4-3 hockey game, but it kind of started out a little bit uh, sleepy. Uh, and the Canucks got scoring from guys like Sam Lafferty and Ilya Mikheyev. And what would they do to take a goal from Mikheyev right about now? So a uh, lot of focus on that line, obviously. Uh, what does the trade do for Elias Pettersson? How does Elias Lindholm look in his debut? And well, what impact does the trade have on Ilya Mikheyev? I mean, his buddy is no longer with the Vancouver Canucks. He was the piece that was sent out. And, you know, it, it wasn't working with the two of them together. So... You know, could there be an upside here? They just need more from him. And he doesn't have to be the high scorer on that line. But he's got, I mean, Rick Tockett said before the break, they need him to play more like Hoaglander. Like, be aggressive, get in, bump guys, take them off the puck, force some turnovers, get the puck to the two Eliases, and let them do some things. And then, you know, Mikheyev hopefully is around the net to try to finish. Again, he, he, they, they score enough goals. So I'm not saying that Mikheyev needs to be, you know, a 30-goal scorer, but he's just been so quiet and so ineffective, essentially, uh, not hurting them defensively, but if you're playing in the top six on a contending team, uh, I do think there are some expectations that you got to hold up your end of the bargain. There are so many ways in which Elias Lindholm is going to be able to help this team. What are you most excited to see in terms of his potential fit? Because there's the power play, there's a PK, there's a two A element, there's the potential scoring with Pedersen. Is there one area in particular that you're most excited to watch? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the guy's a face-off ace and is having a great season. He's above his career high. He's at 55% this year, and so it gives them a right-shot element. And I wonder how much of a hybrid we're going to see between Patterson and Lindholm in terms of where the face-offs are. And, you know, I love that versatility about him. You know, he's just a consummate pro. And the fact that he's been traded before 
Uh, it just so happens he's going back to the place that he broke into the National Hockey League. But, you know, I think that'll ease his transition coming to a, a good hockey club. So I'm curious. We've seen, like, when McKay got back in the lineup, they were slow to roll him on the penalty kill. I wonder, because they've had guys that have sort of found their form and found their role, but Lindholm was second behind Chris Tanev in Calgary in shorthanded ice time this season. So I think he probably wants to be a penalty killer. I think that's an area that he can help the Vancouver Canucks. And you can never be too good in that area, even if you're making strides like the Canucks have. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, they've had a couple of practices. Uh, Rick Tockett said that he liked how, you know, agreeable, essentially, that Lindholm was. That, you know, when they asked him about systems and differences between Calgary and the things that he was seeing here, said, oh, no problem, I can pick that up. And I just think he's a smart hockey player. He's had a bit of a down season in terms of his, you know, production numbers, but he's coming to a team that scores in bunches. And so uh, I think it should be pretty seamless, but like, I'm not going to put a ton of pressure on him to go out and win this game single-handedly tonight. So yeah, I mean, anytime you pay a price to get a player like that, uh, it comes with some pressure. And I think uh, all eyes are going to be on the new number 23 in the Vancouver Canucks lineup, but uh, excited to see what his addition means to this hockey club that, you know, is already uh, playing terrific hockey. And as you guys touched on, what does the break do for both of these teams? Like, I know we're talking, talked a little bit about it kind of feeling like opening night. If you remember, the Canucks didn't have a great preseason, but they were ready on opening night when the Oilers came to town. And so I don't know if they can draw on that, but uh, you know, a little rust on both sides here. Uh, maybe more for Carolina because Canucks had so many guys that actually played over the weekend in, in Toronto. But uh, I'll be curious to see what the start of this game looks like um, just because of the layoff here. To key in a little bit more on Lindholm's potential special teams impact. What do you think he can do for the first power play unit unit? And, and do you think that given the Canucks have this kind of unique movement based um, style that they try and attack with that may require sort of time in terms of understanding how to read off guys and not having played with um, these players before that it may take time for that fit to really materialize on uh, the first unit for Lindholm? Yeah, probably a little bit. And you've got four guys that, uh, again, we're feeling it on the homestand. And the power play went seven for 18. I think that's close to 40%. Obviously, they leaned into it heavily against Columbus in that final game. So, you know, I think for him, it's just kind of stay out of the way a little bit. Like, get to the areas you're supposed to go. Obviously, Kuzmenko, when he played, was a right shot guy that, you know, was sort of the down low guy this year. Wasn't doing as much net front and uh, wasn't as much production for him. So, uh, I, again, I, I think this is where Lindholm just kind of leans into his experience, the veteran savvy that uh, he brings with him. And he'll be a quick learner and quick study, I think, for the Canucks power play. So, you know, I, I, again, it doesn't have to run through him. I just think you want to see him retrieve some pucks, keep plays alive. Uh, you know, Taki pointed to that and said that that was an area that, you know, maybe he didn't even know uh, Lindholm excelled as much as uh, they'd watched some video. And, and he thought that was something that jumped out at him. So, you know, that's something I'm going to be watching here because it's an underrated part of the power play. But, you know, if Puck gets to the corner, uh, who wins those 50-50 battles? If it gets cleared, there goes 25 seconds. If you can come up with it and keep the play alive, uh, regroup and, and, and keep the, the hammer down. So, uh, again, he's joining a terrific situation. I hope he's excited about it. Uh, it's a great opportunity for him. And uh, I would expect it'll be relatively seamless, but uh, there might be the odd speed bump uh, in game number one. Jeff, I was going to ask you, who's the Canuck that needs to step up down the stretch from here? It's Ilya Mikheyev, I think. And yeah. I, I don't think there's many other answers. So I'm going to change my question up a little bit. How long does Ilya Mikheyev have to step up? Because obviously we saw the, you know, we saw the time run out on Andre Kuzmenko. How long does Ilya Mikheyev have to kind of step up here? Yeah, I think it's uh, absolutely worth monitoring. And I know that uh, Rick Tocchet was asked about it a little bit and said they flat out they need more. Uh, you know, they're using Pia Suter on that line with Miller and Besser. So, uh, you know, could they switch it and put McKay? Like, early in the season, I thought that's where McKay was going to go and it was going to be the defensive conscience for Miller and Besser. Now, Miller's held up his end of the bargain. Uh, obviously, Pia Suter has been so seamless wherever he has played. Uh, but, you know, the, the greatest tell about a coach and what he thinks of a player is his usage. And so people can scream from the top of mountains about Nils Hoaglander getting top six opportunities. If Rick Tockett thought that was a good idea right now, Hoaglander would be back there. He was there earlier in the season and Tockett said he thought that Hoaglander got away from, you know, the things that have made him successful to this point lower in the lineup. And so he seems reluctant. Uh, you know, that to me feels like he'd be the next guy. I don't want to live in a world this team has come too far this year. They've made this trade. Phil DiGiuseppe can't find his way back into the top six. And I say that with all due respect to Phil, who's been out of the lineup for a while now. 
Uh, there's probably a role for him, fourth line, some penalty kill duty. Uh, you can never have enough depth, but I don't want to go back to that point in time where Phil Giuseppe, because, uh, I mean, his offense was colder than Ilya Mikheyev's right now. So that's why they're still talking about, you know, the need for one more piece, perhaps, and can they make that happen? And, you know, are they all in? I can't imagine that they're done at this stage with a month to go before the trade deadline, but uh yeah, I, I am going to be watching that closely, Dave, on this road trip. I think uh, McCabe's going to get the opportunity tonight. Uh, you got Boston, obviously, one of the best challenges uh, in the NHL on Thursday. You know, if there's not any sort of spark from Ilya McCabe, I wonder by the weekend if we see some sort of different formulations for the Vancouver Canucks. It's funny that we're talking about even after this Lindholm acquisitions, there still being a couple, or I mean, one question mark in, in Ilya McCabe in the top six. It's funny because even the Miller line has Pia Suter, who I don't think many people imagined him being in the top six at this point in the season, yet he's picked up four goals and six points in his last three games, has been on fire. Why do you think he's had so much success in a top six role lately? He just looks like a really smart hockey player. And I'll admit that you know I knew of the player, but I didn't know all of his tendencies playing in Chicago and Detroit. So uh, you know the fact that he had been consistent as an offensive producer to a degree, like a 14 and a 15 goal score, double digits in all three of his years in the National Hockey League. You know, that tells you that he's got enough offensive flair on the tops to play higher in the lineup. But you're right, when he was signed, like, you know, Bluger was signed on July 1st, and we thought, no, nah, Teddy Bluger is not the answer for a third line center. And then they waited out P.S. Suter and got him for two years. And they thought, okay, like, that's great. That's that's more what you're looking at. But he just brings versatility, flexibility, uh, you know, he seems like uh, so low maintenance, and I think coaches really just appreciate that. And again, uh, he does a nice job of reading off his line mates, whoever he's played with Patterson earlier uh, in the season, and now he's kind of found a home. Uh, you know, is that the long-term answer? They could do worse, but they might be able to do better. And so, again, with the tendencies and the track record of Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin, I, I do think that they're going to beat the bushes a little bit and see what's out there at what price ahead of the trade deadline. But uh, yeah, for the short term at the very least right now Pia Suter's uh holding up his end of the bargain on a, a very good line and it is a little bit of a surprise to me but uh you know good on him he's just kind of puts his head down goes about his business and he's been pretty effective for the Vancouver Canucks go get Frank for Toronto is what I say but we'll see we'll see yep. um just before we let you go Jay Pat uh RC Baines yesterday AHL all-star MVP. We saw a lot of discourse on Twitter of, oh, they got to give this guy a yeah. shot. They got to call him up. What's your take on RST Baines? And I guess as it relates to the conversation of, oh, do they got to call this guy up? Well, he was fresh and ready because he missed the skills competition on Sunday. So uh, he stepped right in. And, uh, awesome. Like, again, just what a week of all stars for the organization, top to bottom. Like, it's an incredible story. And so, uh, you know, he remains uh, very much on the radar, I think, to get a call up. But I, I, you're right, Dave. I saw an awful lot of like, get him on the first flight to Raleigh and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Look, they're playing the Carolina Hurricanes, and then they're playing the Boston Bruins, and then they go back-to-back -back on the weekend, Detroit and Washington. You're not going to get a rookie to dip his toe in the NHL water against the best teams in the league on the road to play eight minutes. Like, it's just not going to happen. So I look at that nine-game homestand in March. I would think that, you know, the organizations on the record is talking about wanting to get some guys in. I'm, I'm ready for them to try somebody else other than Linus Carlson, but I... I think they know what they've got in Carlson. And that's the other thing. Like Linus Carlson, when he gets called up, can't get into the lineup. And he's got more pro experience, a bunch more pro experience than, than R.C. Bain. So, you know, we saw it with Hoaglander last year. You're seeing it with Pud Colson this year. This organization is in no rush to get these guys to the National Hockey League. The league's going to be around for a while. And I do think he'll get his chance. But I just think it's foolish to bang this drum that, oh, because he was the AHL All-Star in a three-on-three -three skills competition – that somehow you're going to plug him in against the Boston Bruins on Thursday and expect the world from this guy. Like, I'm a big believer in setting guys up for success. So get him at home where you can spot him, you can find soft spots uh, in other lineups, you can shelter him, all those types of things. But the idea of just bringing him up to play a handful of minutes, just uh, it doesn't make much sense to me. Plus, Abbotsford's short on bodies. So, um, and the Canucks don't have a roster spot. That's the other thing, too. Like, it, uh, you know, I don't know if they're at their maximum. And Phil DiGiuseppe's out on this road trip, and they would have to. Carson Soucy is not on IR yet, but that's paperwork. And if they do activate uh, Phil DiGiuseppe, I think that's what they would do to make a roster spot for Phil DiGiuseppe. But uh, Phil DiGiuseppe, again, has a track record well beyond Arch Deep Baines at the NHL level. So, uh, good on our steep. That's a great story. Uh, the local angle and all that kind of stuff. But uh, just be patient and keep doing what you're doing. Uh, it's going to happen for him. But I, I think probably 
more likely in March than here in February. Jeff, great stuff as always. Thanks so much for joining us. People can find you on Rinkwide after the game. Who's your co-host tonight? I always yeah, ask. I got Irfan Gaffar and looking forward to it, as I said, right off the top. Like, these are big-time games. We're going to find out a lot about the Canucks and can they pick up where they left off before the break. And They're going to be pushed, but uh, they'll be able to push Carolina too. So it uh, should be some fun. Looking forward to it, and hopefully people will check out Rinkwide Vancouver uh, when it's posted later on tonight. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.